Rise of Christianity in Jerusalem, Historical Sources. 1. We are dependent practically for our knowledge of Christianity in the Apostolic Age upon the books which compose the New Testament. The Jewish historian Josephus furnishes little, if any, information. He gives indeed a brief account of John the Baptist, relates the death of James, the brother of Jesus who is called Christ, and at the close of the famous paragraph in which he speaks of Jesus, adds, the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. The latter passage, however, has probably been largely interpolated by a Christian hand, and even the two other passages, though with much less reason, have been questioned. At the most, Josephus furnishes nothing that is of special value. Of Roman writers, likewise, only Tacitus and Suetonius mention the Christians, and this in connection with Nero's persecution. The former states that Christ, the author of this name, when Tiberius was emperor, was put to death by the procurator Pontius Pilate. Though repressed for a while, the deadly superstition again broke forth, not only throughout Judea, the original home of this evil, but throughout the city, Rome, also whither all atrocious and shameful things flow and are practised. While thus, from pagan sources, glimpses may be caught of the new religion, no real account is obtained of its beginnings and development. Neither is there in the Christian writings of the second century anything which adds substantially to the New Testament records. The historian must depend, therefore, upon the critical study and careful interpretation of the apostolic literature itself. 2. For the earliest period, covering the rise of Christianity in Jerusalem, the authorities are the closing chapters of the four Gospels and the opening chapters of the Acts. None of the so-called apocryphal Gospels are worthy of consideration, even the lately recovered Gospel of Peter being built on the canonical ones and adding nothing of historical value. Still more valueless are the apocryphal Acts of Peter, of John, of Thomas, of Andrew, which circulated chiefly among heretical sects in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. The canonical Gospels, however, came from the Apostolic Age and contain the testimony of original witnesses to the life of Christ. We are only concerned with their closing chapters. These accounts of the Lord's resurrection and post-resurrection life are obviously fragmentary. The last twelve verses of Mark, moreover, are now generally recognized as an addition to the Gospel, having taken the place of the original conclusion, and cannot be considered of equal authority with the rest. Luke's last chapter is, from verse 44, a condensed summary of Christ's final instructions, and is transitional to the account with which the Acts begins. Yet in spite of their fragmentary character, and however difficult it may be to construct a chronological narrative from the material contained in them, these brief apostolic records are of the highest value, not only as testimony to the fact of Christ's resurrection, but also as disclosing the state of mind in which the disciples entered on their independent career. 3. Still more important for our purposes is the book commonly entitled The Acts of the Apostles. Its historical value has been warmly disputed in modern times, although upon it rests the whole traditional idea of the greater part of apostolic history. Evidence of many kinds, however, has accumulated to support its accuracy. That it was written in the first century must certainly be admitted. In fact, after the middle of the second century, it appears as a recognized canonical book, and traces of its use in the churches may be found still earlier. The author was a companion of Paul, for he significantly uses at times in his narrative of the Apostles' travels the first-person plural, chapter 16, verses 10 to 16, chapter 20, verse 5 to 21, verse 18, chapter 27, verse 1 to 28, verse 16, and that this is not an instance of the use by a later writer of an earlier source is demonstrable, first by the general similarity of the style of the we sections with the rest of the book, and secondly by the fact that for the author to have allowed the we of his source to have remained unchanged in his narrative, would have been to pursue a method entirely different from that which he follows elsewhere when using earlier sources. Furthermore, the tradition which appears the accepted one in the second century, that the author was Luke, harmonizes with the notices in Paul's epistles of Luke's movements, as the latter do with no other of the apostles' prominent associates. 
the objection that a companion of Paul ought to have given fuller information, and that he even shows ignorance of much that such a man would have known, proceeds on an arbitrary assumption concerning what Luke would be likely to record, and a failure to appreciate the plan and purpose of his book. 4. What, then, is the value of Acts as an historical source? That Luke carefully gathered his material is expressly stated by him in the beginning of his Gospel, Luke 1, 1 1-4, an earlier book to which he plainly refers, Acts 1, 1 1-2. It is highly probable that he collected his matter not only from oral but also from written sources. He had his own notes on Paul's travels. Then the speeches of Peter and others were probably preserved among the Jewish Christians in writing, other historical records may have been used. Yet Luke does not copy his material slavishly. He weaves it into his narrative, giving much of it in language which is characteristically his own, while at the same time he reproduces in great part the equally characteristic phrases and follows the thought of the original speakers in a way which gives remarkable variety and verisimilitude to his reports. Certainly his opportunities for gathering information were of the best, a companion of Paul, he was acquainted also with some of the leading actors in the earlier history, Acts 21, verse 8 and 18, Colossians 4, verse 14, compare with 10. He appears to have remained in Palestine during the two years of Paul's imprisonment at Caesarea, at which time his materials may have been at least in part collected. 5. His value as an historian, however, is to be estimated in two ways, first by comparison with other sources, secondly by an examination of his method. So far as concerns the first, he may be tested by the epistles of Paul and by archaeological evidence relating to the condition of the places in which his narrative moves. His harmony with the epistles, when both are fairly interpreted, has become more and more manifest with the progress of modern exegetical study. Opinions still differ on details, but in the main the trustworthiness of acts in these matters is certain. Numerous proofs of this will appear in the following pages. Archaeology, likewise, has notably confirmed his record. Here the student is especially debted to the recent works of Professor W. H. Ramsey. Luke moves through the varied and changing political relations of the cities of Asia Minor and Europe with perfect accuracy. He reproduces the local colouring of events and repeats the common parlance of the people about whom he writes. It may be safely said that his accuracy has stood the test of fair investigation. 6. It is often said, however, that in the earlier parts of Acts he is not as trustworthy as elsewhere. He cannot be here tested directly by epistles or archaeology, but he can be tested as to his method. Does it show an intelligent grasp of the situation and a perception of real progress in the history? The answer to this is also favourable. His whole book is arranged on an artistic but not artificial plan to show the establishment by the Spirit through the Apostles of universal Christianity. In his account of the early church in Jerusalem, chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 8 verse 3, he follows a method which shows intelligent comprehension of the course of events and corresponds to what is inherently probable. After describing Christ's last instructions and ascension, and the company which formed the original nucleus of the church, he relates six events, chapter 2, verses 1 to 47, chapter 3, verse 1, to chapter 4, verse 37, chapter 5, verses 1 to 16, chapter 5, verses 17 to 42, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, chapter 6, verse 9, to chapter 8, verse 3, which pertain alternately to the internal and external life of the community, and set forth in a representative way the development of the church and its changing relation to Judaism. He thus conceived the history in its logical relations and understood the movement with manifest intelligence. The book of Acts may therefore be used as an authority of the first order. In Luke is to be found the first Christian historian. It may be added that in using Acts we follow the usually received critical Greek text, the theory of Professor Blass of Halle that Luke issued two editions of his books does not seem to have been verified, and the interesting facts occasionally introduced into the narrative by the alleged first edition of Acts, which Professor Blass obtains from certain Greek and Latin manuscripts, are not sufficiently attested. End of chapter 1